Hello everyone, this is Sherry with the CGH Health Foundation and welcome to our Growing Healthier program. Uh, Growing Healthier is a way that we try to educate a community about uh, important health topics and um, we do these on Facebook Live at noon. And um, if you miss any of them, don't worry about it. You can always find them on our Facebook page or you can go to our cghmc.com website and look for them under our resources tab. You have probably heard the expression, don't do anything rash, and uh, we decided to ignore that because this month we are doing everything rash, and Dr. Bird is going to be joined by Dr. Lucky, one of our family medicine physicians, uh, to talk about shingles and other rashes and uh, vaccine options, etc. So it should be a really interesting conversation. At the Health Foundation, uh, for the last two years, we've been focusing on brain health um, and developing programs uh, for people who are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and also ways to support their caregivers. And we have a couple of programs about brain health coming up. Um, options. And for the first one, it's called the WIT fitness uh, exercise or fitness program. And we're doing that in a uh, partnership with the University of Illinois Extension. And so it is a series of classes um, with brain exercises designed to help improve your memory and cognitive function. Uh, they were supposed to start on January 9th. They'll be the second Tuesday of every month. And they're all year long every month. Uh, we did have to re reschedule uh, last Tuesdays uh, because of the weather. So that one has been rescheduled to January 23rd. Um, and then the remaining classes for the rest of the year will be on the second Tuesday of every month um, from 1.30 to 3 in the afternoon. And those are at our Health Foundation offices at 2600 North Locust. Uh, the second program is called Bingo Size, and we are doing that one uh, in uh, partnership with the LifeScape. And this one combines bingo along with exercises help that help to improve balance and prevent falls. And this one is uh, it's suggested that the caregiver and their loved one come together to attend that one. And uh, that one is going to start on February 12th, and it will meet on Mondays and Fridays for 10 weeks after that. So um, for either of those, if you want to sign up for them or you want more information, you can call our dementia navigator. That is Beth Sturk, and her phone number is 815-625-0400. Her extension is 3977. And before I turn it over to Dr. Bird, I just want to let you know that next month's program um, will be about our uh, cardiovascular um, department. Um, and our speaker is going to be Dr. Um, Hassan Kiso. And he's going to talk about all the ways that our cardiac department can help with prevention and treatment and uh, rehabilitative care after a cardiac event or for your heart. Okay. I guess I'm up. All right, Sherry, thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Bird, Chief Medical Officer at CGH Medical Center. Thanks for joining us today for this talk with Dr. Lucky. Uh, that brain health one was kind of interesting. Uh, that's an, an hour and a half is a long time to exercise your brain, Sherry. So that's you're gonna, it's gonna be a tough workout. If I remember right, like I think our brains burn more calories than any other part of our body. So that, that you'd burn a lot of calories doing that workout, I would guess. Let's get Dr. Lucky on here. Hi there. <laughs> hey, hi, Dr. Lucky. Thanks for joining me today. Ready to talk about rashes? I'm ready to talk about rashes. Yeah, all right. I bet you uh, see a few of those in your practice. We see yeah. a little bit of everything, and that yeah, is a common reason do. people come in. So yeah. Yeah, John's one of our family practice docs, and that's obviously part of the part of the gig in family practice is that you see a lot of rashes. So yep. today, today we're gonna ask questions and i think we also have some slides to look at too for those of you who are watching you can kind of see what we're talking about so as the the title was uh shingles and everything i think something about shingles so let's just start with shingles john sure. um there we go there's a picture or two uh what is what what is shingles john so shingles is a reactivation of the chickenpox virus which is called varicella zoster uh, virus so you might hear it hear people talk about it as zoster or uh, shingles is a more common name for it, but um, anyone who was e exposed or infected with uh, the chickenpox virus, usually as a child, um, can have that virus still harbored 
in the nerve roots at the base of the spine and that can reactivate and it travels along those nerve pathways to the skin and develops this this rash you see the pictures of here uh, what does it feel like for a lot of for patients what do they what do they describe to you a lot of times so yeah the, there's a very classic you know kind of prodrome and syndrome when it starts you'll uh, some people can get achy and feverish and feel like they're getting sick um, and then really often people will develop pain or burning or even some redness on a part of their body before the rash itself develops, uh, which sometimes, you know, leads them down different pathways. I've had people get worked up for chest pain or yeah, for, you know, bulge discs in their spine or something. And right. then a few days later, they break out in this rash and it, it really, you know, kind of proves what was going on. So um, sometimes it can be a little insidious and a little um, deceiving. And then the rash kind of shows itself a few days later, but usually within two to three days of when you start having symptoms, pain, or, uh, you know, numbness in the skin or tingling, um, you would develop the rash. If you have a rash on both sides of your body, do you have shingles? Usually not. It'd be very unlikely. So that's one of the things that helps us determine when we're evaluating someone is that uh, shingles rash is typically unilateral because it comes out of the nerve root at the spine. It doesn't cross your midline. So when someone comes in with a rash that we're not exactly sure what it is, if it's on both sides of your body, that really speaks against it being a shingles rash. I believe in someone very immunocompromised that has a, a systemic, you know, issue. It could, it's possible, but it's really a rule out type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Can you prevent uh, shingles? Yeah, you can. I mean, the, the vaccination's out there. And so uh, it's not approved until age 50. So you, you know, until then you, you can't prevent it. And it does happen in younger people, but it's less common. And as you get older, the immune system that's suppressing that virus in your nerves uh, starts to wane. And that is where it's more likely to reactivate and, and come, come around. And so we do have a vaccination uh, called Shingrix, which is the newest one. Um, if you were vaccinated previous to 2017, you got Zostavax, which was the original vaccine. Um, the newer vaccine is more effective. Uh, it's uh, fairly highly effective. I, I'm impressed that it, they report 96% reduction in symptoms or shingles risk with that vaccine after two doses, which is a really good number for a vaccination. That is. Um, the older vi vaccination was not as effective and waned quicker. So this one, because you get a dose and get a booster, um, the, the effectiveness lasts much longer and it's much more effective. Uh, so yeah. it's a really a good vaccine and a good safety profile. Yeah. How about somebody who, who like ends up getting it? Is it how, is there a treatment for it or do you just have to let it go? Away? Yeah. So the reason to seek evaluation, if you think you're getting shingles, is that if we can catch it within the first three days of the rash developing, we can put you on antivirals, which treat it, but don't prevent it. It can prevent it from getting worse or it can help it heal up quicker. Uh, it stops that virus from replicating and helps your body get ahead of it quicker. And the other caveat with that is that there is a, an entity called post herpetic neuralgia, which is after shingles resolves, that nerve that was infected or inflamed during the process can remain painful uh, for sometimes permanently afterwards. And that's a, another big reason to consider vaccination uh, because everybody can get through a bad bout of shingles for a week or two. But if you're stuck with uh, chronic yeah. pain afterwards, uh, that's that's something that we have to you know potentially treat with medications and it's nerve pain is a hard thing to treat. So um, if you can prevent it or treat it early with the antivirals, if you catch it, then we can uh, that does decrease the risk of a post herpetic neuralgia developing afterwards. Good. OK, well, that's good. I think we, we've hit we've knocked that one out pretty good in terms of questions, unless anyone who's watching the show wants to send us any questions about that. One on. other thing I had marked down was that um, people often ask me, the Shingrix vaccine, the new one, is not a live vaccine. The old uh, one was. So there's a lot of you know people worried about a live vaccine versus not. This is a recombinant vaccine. So it's a piece of the shingles virus that they're given, you're, you're given to amplify your immune response to that. So it's not a live virus if you're told not to get live, live vaccines. Okay. Um, and it's anywhere over 50. So. Yeah, that's great. OK, well, thank you. All right, let's move on to eczema. Yeah. And I bet you, I bet you we have a, oh, yeah. there we go. What's eczema? So eczema, we also call it uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, and some people will even call it just dry skin, but it's more than just dry skin. It's an inflammatory skin condition that's chronic. And it tends to, uh, you know, come and go, relapse and exacerbate depending on individuals and what things tend to trigger it for them. 
but there's some genetics to it. Um, it's more common in people that have other atopic conditions. And when we talk about atopic conditions, those are things like asthma and allergies uh, and sensitivities that cause uh, a, a, your body to overreact to those things. So you get a, you know, a dry, scaly, very itchy patches of skin. Um, they tend to be more focused. They call them the flexural areas of your body, which is where your skin folds on itself. So the inside of your arm, your elbows, the back of your knees, around your neck, groin area, um, but it can happen anywhere, but those are more common areas for it to develop. And eczema is, eczema is, can be on both sides of your body. I can. Unlike the shingles. Yes, it can affect anywhere. Um, it, it's more common in those areas, but, but it can happen anywhere. Okay. Is it preventable and is it treatable? Yeah. So prevention is, you know, one, if you have had it long enough or you know things that aggravate it, certain detergents, you know, a lot of people use scented lotions and too harsh of chemicals when they, when they wash themselves. So that stuff dries out your skin. Um, some people are sensitive to, you know, different scented, scented things. Dry weather is a big thing, which, you know, the winter is when this yeah. Uh, stuff flares up more. So the prevention aspect is avoiding triggers and moisturizing your skin, uh, perhaps not bathing as much or as often as you you know more normally would if you don't have to, because that dries your skin out more as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah treatment is moisturize excessively. We preach it all the time and use the thick, we call them moilant moisturizers. They're the thick aquaphors, the Cetaphils, the you know, Vino uh, CeraVe's, uh, the really thick lotions that don't smell good. <laughs> Those are the things to use as much as possible, especially on the areas that bother you to 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 help it from flaring up. Do you ever use any steroid cream on this? Yeah, absolutely. And if it's you know, we try it. That's that's always the next step. If the moisturizers and avoidance of triggers does not work, we usually go to topical steroids. Uh, which you try to minimize because too much use of those can thin your skin and um, can cause other issues. But um, and they're they're coming out with newer treatments for this for people that have really severe disease, which you would you know seek through your doctor or dermatologist, you know, um, for the, for the more than the standard the standard cases. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. Like you mentioned, like you don't have maybe not quite bathe as much in that our skins naturally have some oil on them that we can sometimes, believe it or not, get take off too much. Right. And Most dermatologists would tell you we probably bathe and overdo it. Now you, and you can also, and I'll, with kids especially, I'll tell families, you know, you don't have to do a long bath. They don't have to sit in there with the bubble bath for you know an hour to play. Uh -huh. um, you know, more tepid water doesn't dry you out as much. You know, right. so uh, just shortening the duration of your showers or baths, especially if you're prone to that and your skin dries out easily, that stuff you can. That's yeah. those easy things you can do, especially during the winter months, to try to minimize it. Right. And don't get me wrong. I, I appreciate when I'm sitting in an auditorium, if everybody's had a good bath. I mean, Absolutely. so please don't stop me. <laughs> Focus on the important areas. <laughs> All right. Anything else you could think of on that one, John? No, I think that was all the points I had marked. So. All right. All right. Let's talk about empatigo. Sure. So, okay. There's a picture. Yeah. So it's common in children. Most likely it's, uh, it's, so it's, uh, it's an actual superficial bacterial infection. Uh, where you get a staph or a strep bacteria uh, in a break in the skin. So it's really common around the nose and mouth where kids are wiping and picking and when they've got colds, rubbing their mm. nose too much and wiping and that bacteria gets in and it causes a red, yellow crusting rash that looks probably looks worse than it really is. It's actually a pretty common skin infection, but um, it is it gets really inflammatory and crusty. Uh, but it's not a cellulitis, which gets in deeper in the skin. This is on the on the superficial aspect of the skin, and it needs a way to get into the skin. So a bug bite, a skin injury, a cut, or just rubbing your skin raw. Uh, not uncommon with eczema that we just talked about. Kids that scratch at their yeah. eczema, if it's not treated, they can get a secondary impetigo on it, and it will and it'll get infected. So how do you treat it? It Typically, we use topical antibiotics. We don't have to do systemic, especially if it's localized in a small area. So um, antibiotic ointments, mupirocin is typically the one we will use. A lot of people can react to triple antibiotic ointments. So I tend to stick with a, a straight up single antibiotic ointment uh, that we can prescribe. Um, and if it's more involved or uh, an area that's hard to apply a lot of topical to, then you can do oral antibiotics that are geared at staph and strep bacteria uh, to treat it as well. Okay. 
Um, how many wrestlers in your practice that show up with that? Right, that and ringworm as well, another common one in the wrestling <laughs> community. So, and they're very particular about avoiding it because it's contagious. And if you've yeah. got a lot of kids that have it and they start, uh, you know, using the same mats and uh, yeah. you can spread it. So, yeah. that's right. All right. Um, great. Anything else on that one? Uh, the only thing out there is another version, if you ever hear that you can have impetigo and it can get to the point where it blisters and it'll form like a big blister on the skin. Uh, that's called bullus impetigo, which is treated the same way, but that is just another version of that. Okay. All right. Let's move on to another rash, psoriasis. Yes. Yeah, so hey, tell me about, tell us about psoriasis, Dr. Lucky. So it's a, another common one, um, you know, and it, it's a very, it's a very broad I guess it can be extremely a big spectrum of d disease severity. Some people say, oh, I have psoriasis and they have one patch that they've treated intermittently throughout their life to other people that have really extensive disease that requires really intense treatment. So it can be extremely variable there. But for the common stuff I see in the office, it's usually smaller patches. Um, it is it's an it's an inflammatory chronic chronic skin condition and it's immune mediated. So it's it's an autoimmune process that that it's developed that develops it. So there's definitely genetics to it. Um, interesting when I was looking up things for this, that a third of people who have psoriasis will have a first degree relative that also has psoriasis. So there's definitely genetics involved. Um, but you'll yeah. this fixed picture is it, it you look for a very well defined uh, plaque. So it's going to be a it's going to be a raised area of the skin that's red and it has a silvery scale to it and it's thick. Um, and it's not one that's easily scrapes off. And if you do actually scratch at it or pull it off, it'll bleed a little bit, which is different than other skin changes. But um, yeah. it's pretty, once you've seen it a few times, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty consistent on what you see when you see uh, psoriasis. This one happens to be around the scalp, which is common, but it can happen anywhere on the body. Do, patient, do patients feel anything with this, these rat, with that kind of rash? It can be itchy. And of course, if it's in areas that are more prone to getting irritated in the groin where the skin's rubbing on each other, it can get broken down and get painful as well too. Yeah. Can you prevent psoriasis and also if what's the treatment for it? Yeah. So it's not, because it's genetic, you can't really prevent it. You either have the risk or develop it or you don't. Um, yeah. uh, but there is some, some, some known like habit things that you could change in your lifestyle. If you do have psoriasis, that's supposed to decrease uh, so that can decrease severity or fl flaring up of it, which uh, it's associated with smoking, um, obesity, alcohol use. Again, they're not direct cause causation. It's it's more things you could avoid because it's known to flare it up more. So that's the, the, the what you can do preventatively. But treatment is if it's simple, small areas, usually topical steroids. Uh, there's uh, vitamin D derivatives that are another prescription topical. Um, people do phototherapy. And then you can't go a day without a commercial on TV about one of the new biologics, which mm. are extremely expensive, effective, and for the very bad cases of systemic psoriasis or psoriasis that's associated with psoriatic arthritis, that are th those those medications are treated by specialists and um, are you know important. Yeah, you just hit on something I wanted to ask ask about yeah. too, and that is just the whole idea that. Uh, particularly with psoriasis, your skin can sometimes be a mirror into the internal parts of your body. Right. And so psoriasis, because it is one of these autoimmune disease where essentially your body is recognizing itself as a foreigner and attacking it, there can be psoriasis can be can have other things going on inside of you um, that can be playing out and affecting you. Um, what should pe people be thinking when people have psoriasis, what would be a sign to them that maybe that's going on or needing to seek medical care because they're concerned about that? The most, the most common thing that we think of with psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis, which is a destructive immune arthritis that causes joint swelling uh, and you know, the destruction of the joint. And that's a definite reason, even if your skin manifestations are not bad, uh, and you wouldn't think you need to treat those because they're manageable with some topicals. If you're having arthritis issues, that needs to be done because you can have joint destruction you can't get back. And so that's where they'll be more aggressive. Uh, and not everybody with psoriasis gets psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and usually several years after onset of the rash is when you can see the arthritis develop. And there are people with psoriatic arthritis that have never shown skin manifestations. So that mm -hmm. is even more complicated. But that's the biggest thing that comes with uh, psoriasis, but there is 
Um, also a higher risk of folks with psoriasis to have inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative yeah. colitis. Um, and there's actually some higher risks on things like myocardial infarction or heart attacks because of just chronic inflammation. Uh, and there's uh, an association possibly with lymphoma risk. So uh, yeah. not direct and not a guarantee. And you shouldn't think if you have some simple psoriasis on your skin that that's going to happen. But those are things that could be could be manifested. Your odds are a little higher than other right. people. Yeah. Anything else about psoriasis that, that you wanted to mention to, to us? No, that was that was everything I had on. There. OK. All right. I, I want to move on to hives. Another mm -hmm. very commonly used word that we hear about. Tell right. us about tell about tell us about hives, Dr. Lucky. So hives or urticaria is the, the term we'll use, which is it's a raised. We call it a wheel, which is like a welt on the skin and it's it's itchy and it's this is an allergy manifestation it's a, a histamine and inflammatory release of the cells that are responsible for uh allergy reactions in the skin uh and it's mod it's mediated by one of your antibodies called ige which is your your allergy antibody in your in your immune system and it's an overreaction um and it you know the skin manifestation of that is is hives uh, more serious manifestations, we talk about anaphylactic shock, which is where your whole body swells, your airway swells, you can't swallow or breathe, and that's obviously an emergency, but um, hives are a, are a less severe version of this, and it's the same, the same underlying principle, but it's just not as severe of a reaction, uh, and it's just isolated to the skin, but it can be miserable, and it's extremely itchy. Um, things that you can be any anything can cause them any it's sometimes honestly most times when we see it it's hard to find out what actually is causing it, especially in the first couple cases uh, because you will you, you you don't have a pattern of what could be causing that so it takes some time to, to develop that but um, you know it's it, it is uh, something that uh, can be from an allergy I've seen people get it post viral um, some people get it uh, from stress some people can get hives from exercise. It would something that triggers your body to overreact and you develop it that way. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, oh, two things. So first of all, um, when would someone, when would you recommend to someone to do testing and to see what's causing it? Um, is it the first yeah. time? Is it? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. If someone, if someone makes it to the office with hives the first time we, I would typically just treat it. And if they have an obvious trigger that they think caused it, then try to avoid that unless it's something that's really difficult to avoid. But uh, more times than not, I see most people don't really have an explanation or are not sure. But of course, if you took a new medication, an antibiotic, and you develop hives, well, then we'll mark that on your chart and avoid it. Um, if you ate <laughs> food that you normally wouldn't eat, you know, we would try to try to minimize that um, if it's something obvious. Otherwise, um, you know, we I wouldn't normally pursue testing because it's it isn't it isn't doesn't usually produce us much answers. Even I've had to refer people with really refractory cases to allergists and immunologists, and they still don't come back with an answer. And you know, it's just not yeah. always an easy thing to identify. Yeah. How do you treat it? How, how do you typically treat it, John? Yeah. So if, if you're at home and it's a simple case and it's bad, you know, Benadryl topically, orally, um, uh, which you can get over the counter, topical steroids work. Um, if we're in the office, we'll use, if it's significant enough, uh, I'll use oral steroids and uh, like prednisone or Medrol. Those are things that will calm it down quickly if someone's really miserable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Anything else on the hives? No, it's pretty carry on. Yeah, Eric, you got viral rashes. You yeah. see a lot of people that have viruses, and believe it or not, they get rashes. Yeah, so it's a, that's a loaded one. It's a, it's a very big encompassing because a lot of things we yeah. probably, you know, if you don't have a good explanation for it and someone's had a, a lot of times a recent virus, people can get a lot of uh, very vague skin skin changes related to a virus. Uh, the picture I have on here is is roseola, which is a common viral exanthem in, in, children, in infants typically, but uh, that actually it's it's a very classic presentation if you've ever had a kid that has a fever without a lot of other symptoms and the day the fever breaks they break out in this full body rash and parents you know flip out a little bit and run in and it's it's a very benign self-limited disease it's a, it's a viral process that resolves but it's impressive and they break out in a pretty impressive rash uh and it's uh but it's always the the case the fever breaks and the, the next day you break out in a rash like this and it's full body so but a lot of other viruses cause very 
nondescript, we use a term called macular papular, which is bumps and splotches. <laughs> it's yeah, <red>. right. <laughs> it can itch a little bit, but it's not usually itchy like uh, like hives or like you know eczema. Um, and uh, it's usually starts in the in the center of the body and works its way out. Um, it doesn't have blisters. It's not a, a vesicular rash like like shingles, but um, you know it's usually. Uh, we've seen it with COVID. I've seen, you see it after a lot of different viral things uh, can provoke a, a skin eruption, and um, just another just another you know example of how your skin is a, is definitely an important organ system in your body. And when you're under stress, it shows itself in these ways. But um, yeah, okay, good. When you hear viral rash, we're not trying to just blow you off and tell you it's nothing. It just it is what it is, and it goes away. And there's not a lot you can yeah. do about it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. The big thing is we rule out other things that can look similar or uh, right. that we can make sure nothing serious is going on. Right. Okay. All right. I have, we have one bonus rash left yeah. for our viewers and it's called molluscum contagiosum. Yeah. Tell us about that. So that is, I see it a lot in kids. Um, it is, it is similar, but not the same as a wart because it's not caused by HPV, which is the wart virus. It's actually thought to be a pox virus but it is a uh, self-limited benign skin condition. Um, you develop these little flesh colored bumps. And if you see on this picture they're, they're they say umbilicated, which means they have a central belly button, which means there's a little indention in the middle. And that's a classic appearance of them. Um, and they can be anywhere on the body because it's, it's, it's viral, it's transmitted by touch. And so kids that you know, touch each other and, you know, play with the same toys. That's how it gets transmitted and their bodies aren't exposed to it yet. So they are tend to prone to develop them. Um, the good thing is, is that they are self-limited and most of them resolve in six to 12 months. Um, if they're on a part of the body, that's not bothersome and, you know, you don't have to treat them and you can wait for them to go away on their own. Um, some kids will, um, auto inoculate themselves, meaning they'll scratch and spread it to other places. Oh, sure. uh, and so sometimes you can, you can treat them with cryotherapy um, and things like that to cause destruction of the lesions to try to provoke your body to get rid of them quicker. But of course that comes with some discomfort. So it depends on the patient. Um, yeah. Remember when I was a kid, I had these and I, and I don't know what the doc gave me, but my family doctor gave me some sort of thing I was supposed to rub on my on these and i i bet you it just went away because it went away rather than the, right. <laughs> stuff. they used to use aldara i we don't really use that anymore which is an immunomodulator and yeah i think this was i'm old enough this was pre-aldara yeah <laughs> i know back in when i was in med school they used to say cimetidine which is tagamet which was supposed to have some kind of property uh, to help get rid of things but again that's not done routinely now really it's either yeah. watch and wait or or freeze them or right. cauterize them you know and and get rid of the ones yeah. Um, adults can get it. It's usually thought to be a sexually transmitted infection in adults. So obviously okay. in those uh, areas that are exposed, so it, it also can be, you can see it later. For adults, do you let it, is it self-limiting or do you try to go at it and try to? If they wanted to treat it, I'd probably treat them more aggressively just because it's probably in a more inopportune area and bothersome. Yeah. So it would be, uh, if they wanted yeah. to treat it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Well, Dr. Lucky, you have knocked out a lot of right. rashes in a short period of time. And for that, I thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lucky's office is at the main clinic um, yeah. here at, at CGH and Shannon Scroggins practices along. Oh, thanks, Donna. Thanks, Donna. Um, uh, Shannon Scroggins practices along with Dr. Lucky. Uh, so Dr. Lucky has been with us now for, gosh, I'm, I'm thinking at least a decade or so. It'll be 15 years this year. So. What? Yeah. Because I know because I started out at over in Morrison when I, where I, when I was practicing over in Morrison. So that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. He's going to be 15 this year. So that is. Uh, <laughs> Anyhow, Dr. Lucky does a, a really, a really nice job with his patients. So we're really fortunate to have him. And, and John, thanks a lot for taking the time uh, no to, do this, do this uh, talk with me. Sure. Happy to be here. All right. Take care. Have a good one. All right. So what I'd like to uh, highlight next, just a, a few things here. Uh, first of all, employees of the month, well, a different direction here. So in our entire in environmental service B shift team, so the folks that work uh, later, uh, they uh, all were the employees of the month. So congratulations to them. I don't know how they're going to divvy up their parking spot, by the way, but that's, I guess they'll figure that out. 
Daisy Award winner, Sarah Dieter. Congratulations, Sarah. Uh, she is one of our uh, OB nurses and she does a, a really nice job up there on the OB floor. So congratulations to her. And then our Sunshine Award goes to Kelly Johnson. And Kelly also um, is a ray of sunshine in our cardiology clinic. So congratulations to Kelly too. Blood drive. I just read that there's a, a critical shortage. Many of you probably saw that in the headlines as well. So yeah, if you're uh, willing and able, please uh, take advantage of February 1st, a blood drive going on there and, and uh, call and make your appointment if you would. Uh, thank you very much for that. And we're doing a live talk. Actually, I'm not. Dr. Song and Pam Kapp are doing a live talk uh, regarding incontinence. And they are, are incontinence and also frequent bathroom trips, all those type of female health um, bladder related things. And actually, in some respects, there are some men who have those issues too. But anyhow, the two of them are going to be giving a talk on uh, January 18th. And I encourage you to come on down and, and listen to what they have to say. They're, out, they're both really uh, good speakers and have a lot, will have a lot of good information. And as Sherry alluded to at the beginning of our broadcast, I'll be uh, chatting with Dr. Kiso next month and talking about cardiology, all things cardiology. We'll talk about some rhythm things, some heart related topics. And there's a, there's a lot of heart related issues out there. So I'm, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. I think I've covered what I need to cover for the day. I want to thank all of you for taking the time uh, to watch this. And if you found it helpful, please feel free to share that with your friends and family. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca teed me up on. So we have this weather coming in, it uh, sounds like tonight, tomorrow-ish. Uh, that's where you can find more information about weather-related stuff and where we're at in terms of our clinics and them um, being full capacity or not. So that's the, the where we have that on our website. And I think our Facebook page, we're going to be, ha we're going to have some um, stuff up there as well. So thanks for reminding me, Rebecca. Hey, one other thing before, before I leave, I, I still do encourage folks to, if you, if you haven't had COVID, the re most recent bout of COVID, or you haven't had influenza yet, I still, I think it's still worth getting a shot. Um, you know, cause it's really, it's really out there, <laughs> both influenza and COVID. And, and we're having people that are hospitalized for that too. If you're if you're at a high risk type of situation. So I'd encourage you to get those. I had COVID, I think it was, was it a couple of weeks ago. And I had this, I'd had the shot, but I really felt like my symptoms were much milder there than they had been uh, before. And I, I attribute it to the shot. Um, so anyway, I encourage folks to, to go ahead and get that. So, all right. Hey, this is Bill Bird, chief medical officer at CGH. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this and have a great day and we'll be back. Thanks.